It's been a solid tradition on this channel for a full two years now where I take a look at the Home Alone film's traps and figure out just how deadly they truly are in real life using some pretty simple math. 2015 was the first film and 2016 was the second film and now, despite the fact that many people hate this film, we're keeping the tradition going and moving on to Home Alone 3. And even though this movie is a bit worse than the first two, you have to admit, the traps are absolutely nuts. So let's hop in and see what can be done with all this material. Which traps in Home Alone 3 are actually deadly in real life? Hello, I'm the Theorizer, and for the sake of simplicity, we'll be excluding all antics except for when things really start as standard Home Alone traps. This basically means everything from the electrocutions and on. Also, this movie has considerably less physics than the previous two. Just lots of falling, and there, there aren't a whole lot of traps I could, well, calculate, but I'll try my best. So let's start off by looking at the electrocutions, and fair warning, this is not my area of expertise, but I do know a little bit. So please, electromagnetism scholars, tell me if I flop this. We start off with Burton Jernigan, who sits upon a metal chair out back, but it's electrically wired to a large battery for a golf cart. Now this becomes an extremely difficult thing to calculate, but if Alex wired it correctly, it could very well be lethal. Some golf cart batteries vary from 36 volts to 48 volts, but many are measured as 18 amp hours, and so it's quite possible that, for the duration of his sit, Burton is being hit with a full 18 amperes. Now, whether the chair puts a bunch of resistance between him or not is quite a tricky thing to work around, but for this trap, just know this, he'd likely be dead. Anything even close to 18 amps will shut off the human heart in an instant. In fact, anything over 0.1 amps will kill a human. Humans have quite a bit of resistance in their skin, but I can say with a good certainty that this would essentially fry him if it was truly set up accurately. Next, we move on to Earl Unger, the weird one. This took me a while to figure out. What he does here is he walks up to a bunch of yarn, but it's interweaved with a copper wire. So when he pulls out his pliers to cut it, the amperage from the electrical outlet shocks through him and causes him to electrocute. Modern residential homes have a current of 120 volts flying out of one of those outlets, and the typical formula to find the amps that equates to is by dividing the volts by the resistance of whatever the electricity is going through. Since it's a wire, we need to use the resistivity formula and a whole bunch of stuff that I'm still self-teaching. However, after I spent hours painstakingly comparing measurements, I found the length and thickness of this wire. It's around four feet long and a couple millimeters wide, paired with the assumption that that it's copper, we can find the resistance through the wire, and therefore the amps. At the immediate area of contact with the pliers, about 2,160 amps are blasting out there. Now that seems rather high, but when you look at the resistance of human skin, it can be quite high. However, it's snowing out and his skin is moist. This reduces things significantly, but still makes the whole situation dubious and suspicious. So, we'll go the trusty route and give this one a 0.5 on the death toll. Next up, Unger runs and jumps over the wire, landing on a mat which was resting on marbles, causing him to slide into an outward poking door knocker. So I measured the distance he slid and then timed it with the most accurate measurements I could find, no thanks to the film's timing inconsistencies. Finding both these therefore finds the speed he slams into the door with. 3.8 kilometers per hour, or 2.4 miles an hour. Not very fast. But since an average man, the size of Earl Unger, would weigh around, meh, I don't know, around 195 pounds at maximum, and his body has those 11 centimeters of door knocker into his neck to slow down, it means that he slams into that with a force of 450 newtons. That equates to 100 pounds of force on his neck and face. Not deadly, but it could cause some bruising and disfigurement. Since force divided by area is pressure, we measure the area on the knocker to find that he's being poked with around 35 psi. It, however, takes 100 psi to break the skin, so this one is not 
deadly. But this next one, however, yikes, it'll hurt a bit more. Peter Beaupre shows up and disables all of the traps that hit Unger. Then he cuts a wire, thinking he's clever, but it causes a trunk full of books to slam out of the attic window and hit them on the heads. So, I did a lot of estimating here. I estimated the weight of the trunk, calculated the number of books that may fit, and the weight of each one. And I estimated that around 130 pounds would be the middle ground weight here. It slides off of the third story and lands on their heads. They give it about six inches of buffer because they put up their arms, but it still sends them back. So taking into account the weight, and the speed I calculated that it could land at, and that buffer, we get a force of 16,220 newtons, or 3,600 pounds, being shared by each of them, as this massive and fast trunk slams into them. And none of these calculations factor in air resistance either, so jeez. But because they put up their arms to stop it, this would most likely result in a spinal compression, or broken arms. Unfortunately, we have to give this one a 50-50 again, which means there's half a chance Unger would die, and half a chance Beaupre would die. Then out back, Journeygin is playing with some water, but this is nothing I can calculate, nor is it deadly at all, so we can skip and move right on to Peter and Earl, because then a huge barbell slips off of the gutter and smacks them directly in the heads. I'm going to say right now that this is impossible to survive. Their heads are goo now. Want proof? Well, I measured and calculated the weight of this whole cast iron exercise tool, which took hours of painstaking geometry and rational proportions. <clears throat> But I did it. This thing weighs, give or take, 168.74 kilograms, or 372 pounds. Since it drops down 20 feet or two stories, this equation we can find incorrectly written in my profile picture can help us. It actually looks like this and bada bing bada boom, 20 miles an hour upon impact. But this trap is a bit different than the trunk full of books because this one slams right through them. So we have to use the momentum formulae and the impulse to find the force. Blah, blah, blah. I timed some things and got 6,500 newtons. That's around 720 pounds of force on each individual head of theirs, which is more than enough to fracture the skull. A skull will be crushed with a mere 520 pounds, but this with included movement and it's much, much more. They be mush. Two deaths here, next trap. So these next ones are pretty pointless, non-harmful, and not something I can really calculate. You know, I could calculate this stuff hitting its face, but it's just like getting hit with a water balloon. Minimal pain, barely any force, and it's certainly not deadly. Also, Alice loses a glove, and Peter injures his back when he pulls too hard on something. Then his eyes get spray-painted. Nothing deadly, nothing calculable, just pointlessness. But then, the fourth and final bandit, Alice Ribbons, goes around the side of the house and she gets stuck in mud and a flower pot flies at her from 20 feet on the roof, hitting her bang on the head. I spent another several hours measuring the pot, calculating the weight of the ceramic, and then the weight of the dirt, and then the damn flower. These pots are around 14.2 kilograms each, or about 30 pounds. Not too far-fetched for someone who's just compared a flower pot to a boy's head, then compared his head to his mother's upper half, then looked up the actress's height and used rational proportion to analyze thoroughly exactly what the width of the pot's ring is, to then use this formula to find the volumes and- Oh my god! <coughs> the dedication! With these Home Alone videos, I swear it's real! Anyways, I timed the time it took to fully come to a stop as it hit her head, and I figured out the speed it was going at that point. Using momentum and impulse, I found that this thing hits her with 1,750 newtons, or about 390 pounds of force. That's extremely dangerous, and won't crush the skull, but it could still knock some things loose. So let's give it another point. Next is the Lawnmower Massacre, which is very obviously deadly. I can't calculate this one, I can just show you how a lawnmower works. Yikes, he dead. But up next is some more Alice with pots. It was mostly the same as before, except there's a bit of height change, and the time of buffer is a bit different, but the force makes out to be very similar, so yet again, a point five. 
Up next, Earl has a window barely touching his head, and he acts all hurt. Um, yeah, nothing here that's deadly or calculation worthy. In fact, nothing he does during this whole antic session with the glue in the box wheels is deadly or worthy of math. All that happens upcoming is a mouse trap on his fingers. But Peter has a huge metal stick fitted with a punching glove, smack him in the nutsack. Measuring the distance, time, and the time to slow down, we have our answer. A pretty minor force of 207 newtons, but that actually equates to around 46 pounds. Tell me that wouldn't hurt down there, but no, nothing deadly. When he lands, his gun blows up, but still, nothing deadly. But then Jernigan falls three stories into a concrete basement. Referring to my formule, estimating his weight and doing some more impulse momentum stuff, we find that he hits the first story with a force of almost 2300 newtons or 510 pounds. Definitely enough to disfigure a thing or two in his legs. But then he slams through and lands on the basement toilet, causing an additional 38,000 newtons of force on his spine, back, legs, and everything. Definitely a point here. Good job, Jernigan, keep on dying. Then back to Alice, who thinks she's smart by hovering above Alex's trap on the stairs. However, he booby-trapped the banister as well, causing her to flop four feet onto the steps below, impacting them by half a foot. Based off of the actress's weight, we can easily calculate this out to be a landing force of 4,300 newtons. Now, this honestly isn't 100% deadly in the way it's done. She would just need a wicked chiropractor to snap it back into- Oh, never mind, she did it herself. No points. Then, Peter Beaupre fake farts, but Alice does a bunch of flips onto the porch. As she walks towards the back door, the planks beneath her rotate upon her gravitational force downwards, causing her to fall into the furnace room. After doing some wild rotational physics, I concluded that the planks would whack her head at about 17 miles an hour. Think about that. Ouch. Somewhere above 500 newtons hitting her head, but still not deadly. Then she lands, going another 17 miles an hour when she lands. That may cause some dislocations or breaks in parts of her legs or feet, but nothing too major. However, then Beaupre walks over to the planks, hits his head, and lands on her. This is injuring to her organs in the way he lands, and it actually warrants a 0.5 for Alice here, but nothing for Pete. Now, the majority of the good traps are over, but there's a few huge ones left. First, Alice swings a field hockey stick at Jernigan's balls. Based off of the distance swung, the time it took, the light mass of the field hockey stick and the distance above her into his groin. We can use the usual calculations to find that this equates to a force of only about 83 newtons. But think about it, that's around 18 and a half pounds on his testicle, which is certainly painful. No death here though. Moving on. Then there's a couple of decoys and gags and they bang their heads together, but nothing all too deadly in the grand scheme of things. But then comes the pool scene. One simply cannot just jump three stories and expect to be fine. So they jump off of the second story's roof, and Jernigan and Unger fly right through a decoy lining of the trampoline fabric before falling into the mostly empty pool, landing in three feet high icy water. After doing all of the calculations, I came to the conclusion that this was overly dangerous of them. They landed each with 165,000 newtons. That is the highest newton number of this whole Home Alone trilogy so far. Both of them are dead, especially because they land on their backs, sort of. So, fractured spines, necks, heads, legs, dead. Intensive care couldn't spare their sorry buttocks, probably because they were imploded during the landing. Double death. And then my personal favorite trap is Alice Ribbon's narcissistic idiocy finally getting to her. She falls four stories down the dumbwaiter shaft onto her neck. This is far and away the most deadly trap in the whole damn series, as far as positioning and landings go. Holy hell. Look at this. It's horrific. She falls 35 feet down a shaft, and neglecting friction, she lands at 32 miles an hour. Since her spine can compress probably around 3 inches into her neck and suit and butt, this means she lands with approximately 75,000 newtons. Instant death. 
That's like throwing 8.3 tons onto your spine. It won't end well. You know, there's a semi-occult fetish fan club that loves to sensualize Alice Ribbons. They're all over YouTube, and some of the comments are hilarious, but so inappropriate that I cannot read them aloud during a Christmas special. <clears throat> And other than Peter's firework explosion, which warrants a 50-50 for third-degree burns, we're done. That's four deaths for Burton, three for Unger, two for Peter, and two or three for Alice. A total of 11 to 12 deaths in this film. My god. See you next year with the most abysmal link in the Home Alone franchise. I'm the Theorizer. Theorizer.